In my previous video, I examined several common arguments for common ancestry and refuted them. Most of these arguments were based on genetic, molecular, or anatomical similarities. However, such evidences can only be used to either confirm or contradict a theory of common descent based on the fossil record. The fossil evidence will always have to do the heavy lifting for any case either for evolution or against it. While the fossil record as a whole is problematic for evolutionists, they have some candidate fossils that they claim demonstrate common descent. So in this video, we will examine the fossil record. The fossil record is the only means we have to directly look at the history of life on Earth. If universal common descent were true, the fossil record is where we would see evidence for it. We would expect to see a gradual tree-like pattern emerging with simple organisms gradually becoming more complex. Evolutionists have argued that the fossil record is incomplete. This is true, however the fossil record is adequate to see the general history of life. We should see a basic tree pattern with lots of intermediates if common descent is true. Some evolutionists, like Richard Dawkins, have tried to downplay the importance of the fossil record. He says, There is more than enough evidence for the fact of evolution. We don't need fossils. The evidence for evolution is watertight without them. We are, as I say, lucky to have fossils at all. As we saw in our last video, the other evidence offered for evolution is far from watertight. Dawkins knows full well that the fossil record doesn't look good for the theory of common descent, and so he pretends the fossil record is trivial. However, this is just not so. Charles Darwin himself said, Why then is not every geological formation and every stratum full of such intermediate links? Geology assuredly does not reveal any such finely graduated organic chain, and this, perhaps, is the most obvious and serious objection which can be urged against the theory. While the fossil record does not show a pattern even remotely resembling descent from a common ancestor, it looks exactly like we would expect if the polyphyletic model is correct. The fossil record contains a series of explosions where new types of animals appear suddenly without evolutionary precursors and subsequently diversify only slightly, just as the polyphyletic view predicts. The animals appear suddenly and without any obvious transitional fossils. This poses a problem for our theory of universal common ancestry. However, it makes perfect sense if the polyphyletic view is correct. Nonetheless, evolutionists believe they have discovered a few transitional fossils that are sufficient to establish common ancestry. It is to these specimens that we now turn. But bear in mind that even if any of these transitions turned out to be legitimate, they are the exception, not the rule in paleontology. One of the most famous fossils that is used as an example of a transitional is Archaeopteryx. This is supposed to be a transition from reptiles to birds. Archaeopteryx had wings and feathers like modern birds, However, it had teeth and a lizard-like tail. So was Archaeopteryx the ancestor of modern birds? The problem is Archaeopteryx's location in the fossil record. Archaeopteryx is 153 million years old, while its supposed ancestors, the dinosaurs Cynosopteryx and Caudiopteryx, are only 125 million years old. This makes Archaeopteryx's ancestors younger than Archaeopteryx itself. Archaeopteryx was a true bird, from its bird feathers, to its bird bones, to its bird lungs, the fossil bears all the signs of having been a bird. There is no compelling reason to think it is an intermediate, and this is now acknowledged by the scientific community. Jonathan Wells says, Paleontologists now agree that Archaeopteryx is not the ancestor of modern birds, and its own ancestors were the subject of one of the most heated controversies in modern science. The missing link, it seems, is still missing. The fossil Tiktaalik rosea remains a popular example of a supposed transitional between fish and tetrapods. According to Richard Dawkins, Tiktaalik is the perfect missing link. Perfect because it almost exactly splits the difference between fish and amphibian, and perfect because it is missing no longer. There are, however, numerous problems with Tiktaalik being an intermediate. First consider that its fins did not connect to its skeleton. This means that they could not have supported Tiktaalik's weight on land, and are therefore unlikely to be intermediates between fins and legs. They are the same sort of fins that the fish coelacanth has. Tiktaalik's fins were used for maneuvering while swimming, not walking. 
Second, it is impossible for Tiktaalik to be an ancestor of tetrapods because the new fossil evidence shows that tetrapods predate Tiktaalik. In the Zalkami Quarry in Poland, fossilized tetrapod footprints were discovered that dated to 397 million years ago. This means the tetrapods existed at least 12 million years before Tiktaalik existed, therefore Tiktaalik is not the ancestor of tetrapods. One supposed transition that evolutionists say is well evidenced is the therapsid to mammal transition. This transition contains numerous fossils leading from mammal-like reptiles to the early mammal Morconduon. When arranged in a nice series like this, the fossil evidence looks very compelling. However, things are not nearly so clear-cut as the evolutionists present them. The fossils are arranged only with consideration for their morphology. However, factors such as age and size are also important. It turns out that when these additional factors are considered, we don't see a smooth progression from therapsid to mammal any longer. Several fossils appear suddenly, as though they were contemporaries of one another, not a lineage. Many of the fossils are separated by long periods of time, making it impossible to say anything about a possible connection. Stephen Meyer says, The different skeletons shown in transitional sequence, including mammal-like reptiles, were not found close together geologically. In fact, some supposed ancestors and descendants were found in widely separated layers of sedimentary rocks representing tens of millions of years in geological time. Additionally, evolutionists often alter the sizes of the fossils to make them all look about the same. In reality, the sizes of the fossils vary greatly, making it unlikely that we are witnessing a lineage of any kind. Another common example that is supposed to give evidence for evolution is the whale transition. Supposedly within an 8 million year period, the land mammal Pachycetus gave rise to the modern blue whale. Considering the vast differences between land mammals and fully aquatic whales, it is already doubtful that 8 million years is really enough time to accomplish this level of change. Large scale changes would have to take place in the areas of swimming, breathing, and reproduction. While most of the animals in this supposed transition are pictured as swimming, Pachycetus through Rhodocetus actually lived mainly on land, not making them very promising candidates for precursors to whales. In fact, the Maocetus gave head-first birth, which is a universal birthing posture for large land mammals. Furthermore, in 2016, paleontologists discovered a fossil very similar to Basilosaurus, dated at 49 million years old. Jonathan Wells says, this would reduce the time available for land mammal to whale evolution from 8 million years to practically no time at all, making the problem of whale evolution even worse. Since this fossil is older than many of the fossils that supposedly led to modern whales, this means many of these fossils aren't ancestors of the modern whale at all. But then, where are the ancestors? Perhaps the most famous icon of evolution is human evolution. The hominid transition supposedly shows how humans gradually evolved from primitive ape-like ancestors. When the fossils are laid out like this, they look very convincing. However, the devil lies in the details. Things are not nearly this cut and dried when one closely examines the actual hominid bones. A detailed study of the hard data reveals that each category of fossils is either fully human, fully primate, or a mix of bones from each category. Homo neanderthalus was not significantly different than modern humans. The only difference of note would be the shape of their skull. However, the Neanderthal skull shape is found in some modern humans, such as the Russian boxing champion Nikolai Valyov. Therefore, the Neanderthal skull is within the range of Homo sapiens. Neanderthals were certainly contemporaries of modern humans, as graves containing both modern humans and Neanderthals have been discovered. In fact, the DNA of Europeans and Asians is 1-4% to Neanderthal, meaning that modern humans interbred with Neanderthals and are therefore the same species. Archaeology has revealed that Neanderthals crafted tools, made clothing, wore makeup, and even had burial ceremonies. All of this indicates that Neanderthals had a very high level of intelligence, like modern humans. Marvin Lubenow says, that Neanderthals and anatomically modern humans were buried together constitutes strong evidence that they lived together, worked together, intermarried, and were accepted as members of the same family, clan, and community. As with Neanderthals, Homo erectus is nearly identical to modern humans, besides his skull. Erectus' skull is argued to be primitive, and his brain case small, therefore making him a subhuman ancestor. However, the brain case for Erectus is, on average, 940 centimeters. 
This is large enough to fall within the range of modern humans, which measure from 800 to 2,220 centimeters. Additionally, the skull is not so much primitive as it is deformed and degenerate. This suggests that Homo erectus was not an evolutionary precursor to humans, but rather an offshoot from humans who interbred and as such suffered from genetic deterioration and deformity. Archaeology confirms that Erectus had the intelligence of modern humans, as we've discovered that Erectus knew how to control fire, had sophisticated language, and even had the ability to sail across water. According to paleo expert Gabriel Lasker, Homo erectus is distinct from modern man, but there is a tendency to exaggerate the differences, even if one ignores the transitional or otherwise hard to classify specimens and limits consideration to the Java and Peking populations. The range of variation of many features of Homo erectus falls within that of modern man. Homo floresiensis was also substantially human in its anatomy. Floresiensis was smaller than most modern humans and had an asymmetrical skull. These features are used to argue that it was a transition. However, the bones of Florsiensis show evidence of being infected by serious pathologies such as microcephaly, which would account for its unique skull shape. Since Florsiensis was confined to the island of Flores, it seems likely that the species was subjected to insular dwarfism, which is a well-documented phenomenon which occurs when populations of mammals are genetically isolated, limited in food supply, and engage in inbreeding. This is likely what happened to Homo Florsiensis. This would account for the small size. It is also worth noting that if Florsiensis was able to get to the island of Florens, then it had seafaring capabilities and therefore a high level of intelligence. Given these factors, many paleontologists believe Florsiensis was just an offshoot of Homo erectus, and as we've seen, there is no good reason to think erectus was anything other than Homo sapien. Australopithecus afarensis, perhaps best known as Lucy, is represented only by a few collections of isolated bones. Paleontologists debate if all of the bones attributed to Afarensis are really even of the same species. In fact, all bones that clearly belong to Afarensis are remarkably similar to those of chimpanzees. Afarensis's feet bones were never found, yet it is said to have left human-like footprints because of the discovery of fossilized footprints that are identical to modern human footprints. The problem with this is that these footprints were not only discovered more than 1,000 miles away from any of Afarensis's remains, but also the footprints are almost half a million years older than Afarensis. A full foot has never been found for Afarensis, however we have found Afarensis's hands and wrists. What is significant is that its wrists feature a locking mechanism like those found in primates, which stabilizes them for walking on all fours. This suggests that Afarensis didn't walk upright at all, therefore it is reasonable to conclude that Afarensis is a full ape and is not a relative of humans. Artipithecus remedis is supposed to link apes to humans. However, the basic problem with this specimen is that we have absolutely no idea what Artipithecus even looked like. The bones in this taxon were so poorly preserved and so badly crushed that they literally crumbled when touched. Artipithecus took over 20 years to reconstruct, and most of the reconstruction was guesswork based on the assumption of common ancestry. From the bones that are in decent enough condition to work with, all indications are that Artipithecus was fully ape. John Sanford and Christopher Roop say, The remains attributed to Arti and its kind, Aramidus, do not represent convincing evidence pointing to an early ancestor to man. All of the major features cited by the Discovery team in their attempt to place Arti in the direct human lineage are based on extremely questionable reconstructions and inferences. The traits presented as evidence that Arti was in the human lineage are the very same features currently seen in living apes. Homo habilis is a non-existent taxon. Habilis only continues because it provides a much needed link between apes and humans. It exists as merely a convenient way to classify unknown hominid bones, and this is recognized by leading experts in the field of paleoanthropology. The taxon is comprised of primarily Australopithecine bones, but also contains some bones from Homo. The bones attributed to habilis are routinely reclassified. All of this has led Tattersall and Schwartz to say, Homo habilis is an all-embracing wastebasket species into which a whole heterogeneous variety of fossils could be conveniently swept. Even if habilis was a legitimate taxon, it could not be an ancestor of modern humans, because the earliest habilis bones date to later than the earliest homo bones. 
Australopithecus sevdia and Homo naledi face similar problems to Homo habilis. They seem to be waste bin categories that consist of both Australopithecine and Homo bones. Thus, as far as the fossil record is concerned, Australopithecine and Homo have always been separate categories. In plain English, there is no convincing reason to link apes and humans. The evidence for this is wholly lacking. Additional problems plague evolution from the fossil record. As an example, leaf insects appear over 100 million years before leaves in the fossil record. Evolution would have predicted that leaf insects evolved to look like leaves for camouflage. However, this is clearly not what happened. As Giuseppe Sermonti says, these astute animals are taken as examples of mimetic adaptation. But they proved embarrassing when paleontologists started following their fossil traces and found them where they were not supposed to be. The oldest fossils of stick or leaf insects, protophasmids, go back to even remoter periods in the Permian, 250 million years ago in the Paleozoic. Plants with flowers and leaves appear no earlier than about 100 million years ago, long after the first protophasmids. Now evolutionists will object that the fossil record is incomplete. Certainly the fossil record is incomplete in the sense that every creature that ever lived has not been fossilized. However, for the purposes of studying the history of life on Earth, we are concerned with the degree to which the fossil record represents the different types of organisms that have lived. How can we test the fossil record's adequacy? We simply see how many known organisms are represented as fossils. When this test is done, we see that the fossil record gives a remarkably accurate picture of the history of life. Consider that of the 43 known living orders of terrestrial vertebrates, 98% are represented as fossils. Of the known living families of terrestrial vertebrates, not including birds, which have a lower probability of being fossilized, 88% are represented as fossils. At lower taxonomic levels, such as genre, numbers drop to more like 66%. But all of this indicates that the fossil record is reasonably accurate, at least for assessing most of the history of life. Significantly more is preserved than is not. William Dembski and Jonathan Wells say, The fossil record actually looks quite good, at least in drawing the broad contours of life. The evidence here is clear and points overwhelmingly to the fossil record as being a faithful preserver of organisms. The absence from the fossil record of transitional forms connecting organisms at higher levels of classification is therefore evidence that no such transitional forms ever existed. Thus, while the fossil record is imperfect, it is adequate to test common ancestry. The problem is that the fossil record doesn't show any evolutionary precursors to the major life forms. The simplest and most parsimonious interpretation of the fossil record is that the reason why we don't see any evolutionary precursors to animals in the fossil record is because they simply never existed in the first place. <laughs>